Good morning, I'm Judy Braswell with Lakeview Health. We are so glad that you can join us today. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. There is a Q&A box where you can submit your questions at any time during the presentation and we will uh, have time at the end where we will answer um, the Q&A as well as being able to send out a transcript after. Uh, there is the option within the Q&A box to uh, select to submit your question anonymously if you would like to do so. At the end of the presentation, there will also be a contact slide that will give you information on uh, how to reach out if you have questions that you think of after the presentation, uh, would like additional information. And then lastly, the recording and that uh, transcript will be sent out by Diane Towers following this, so be sure to watch for that email. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Diane Towers with Altair. Thank you, Judy, and welcome, everyone, and thank you for attending. First, I would like to thank Judy and her team from Lakeview Health for partnering with Altair to bring this presentation. The presentation is Managing Mental Well-Being While Working From Home. Today's speaker is Gabrielle Latore. She is a licensed mental health counselor who has five years experience in the field. She received her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling from the University of North Florida, and she has her license in mental health counseling in the state of Florida. I would now like to turn this over to Gabrielle. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, as they were mentioning, today's topic is going to be on managing mental health while working from home, which is a really challenging topic. Um, I will go ahead and begin our slideshow, and as Judy mentioned, go ahead and bring up any questions that you have throughout the presentation, and we'll have time at the end to answer them. So many of you are probably used to seeing headlines like this on your cell phone, on your computers, and every day whenever you turn on TV. Um, since March, which is about to hit the year mark very, very shortly. Um, as you have probably experienced yourself, the uncertainty of this whole pandemic causes much stress, even on a low-lying level throughout your daily lives. The uncertainty as far as numbers, vaccine prevalence, um, availability of the vaccine, how many people are getting infected and infection rates. Um, through statistics, we've noticed that many individuals are specifically increasing in their stress as far as financial stability, stability in job, um, and stability in home life. Here are some of the statistics. About 30% of Americans are experiencing decline in mental health right now. 45% of adults feel the COVID stress has negatively impacted their mental health. And more than 50% of Americans worry about getting infected by COVID, losing their job, and the financial impact of such. So just to give an example of what might be creating such a specific increased stress with COVID, as opposed to maybe other stressors that you guys are familiar with managing. Um, in a hurricane, which is something that we in Florida deal with on an average basis, there's plenty of advanced warning, at least a day or two minimum. Um, we have already set up systems and protocols that many of us are used to following every day um, in a hurricane situation, and many of us can anticipate it. With COVID, there's not much that we can actually pre-prepare ourselves with and anticipate. One of the things about humans and our brain chemistry is that we love patterns. We're very pattern oriented. Um, patterns help us feel safe. It helps us feel secure. They help us feel like we have some semblance of control. So for example, if we're in a crisis that we're used to managing, such as a hurricane, we have a pattern that we've already developed within ourselves. I'm going to the grocery store to get water, I'm going to get panels for my window, so on and so forth. But with COVID, this is not something that many of us would have dealt with um, 
in any sort of similar capacity. And so we don't have a pre-prepared pattern that we can follow and go along with. So with COVID, it's already an uncertainty that, you know, on a surface level is anxiety provoking. On top of the fact that mentally our brain is having a hard time conceptualizing, what do I do next? And within this pattern seeking behavior that we have, when we aren't able to rely on those patterns and those cues that we have from the outside in our environment, we try to look for patterns wherever we can which is part of the reason why we're seeing such an increase in mental health difficulties, substance use, and eating disorders, is because again, we're looking for patterns where we can. And sometimes our pattern behaviors are not necessarily healthy behaviors. Let's take substance abuse, for example. Substance abuse is something where you can have this patterned relationship with alcohol or a drug of choice. Same thing with an eating disorder. You have a patterned relationship with food where you can rely on, okay, this next moment, I'm going to be able to reach for this snack. It's going to fulfill me in X way. I can rely on that response and I can rely on the fact that I have access to food. And so at, in our pattern seeking, we sometimes turn towards these unhealthy forms of coping that we find comfort and we find um, sustainability and these things that we perceive that we might have more control of when our external environment is feeling a lack of control. And so within this, um, it, it's part of the reason why we're seeing those increases, because we're seeking control, we're seeking patterns where we can. Um, and again, COVID is particularly straining on this because we don't have a set pattern for what this is going to look like. We don't have a set pattern to identify what this has looked like in the past for us personally. So working from home during COVID is not something that is unusual right now. Many individuals are either working from home full time or they're doing some combination of working from home and going into office. So here's a couple of statistics just from what we can tell and I've labeled this the bad news. 78% of the global workforce report, reported negative impacts to their mental health this year. 42% say that their productivity has plummeted. 41% say that they are challenged because there is less distinction between their work life and their home life. That's gonna be a big topic that we go into. 40% report an increase in poor decision-making. 38% are experiencing more stress. 35% are experiencing a lack of work-life balance. 25% are reporting burnout. Another 25% say that they are depressed. 14% say they are feeling lonely. And 85% say mental health issues at work affect their home life in terms of sleep deprivation, 40% say poor uh, physical health, 35% reduced happiness at home, 33% changes in family relations, and 30% in isolation from friends. Um, sources at the bottom. And so many of you might be experiencing a couple of these columns, just statistically. Um, the possibility of employers keeping their staff at home or remote for the foreseeable future may seem daunting, um, especially because, again, we don't have that reliability to go back on and say, okay, this is going to be ending by X date. Um, going back to our previous slide with all those headlines, we had so many projected dates of when we were going to be able to return to, you know, air quote, normal. And those dates have all come and passed, and we still don't really have a clear picture of when that'll be. So many businesses can't give any sort of assurance to their employees as far as when they'll be able to return back to their normal work life. Um, and sometimes thinking about, oh gosh, when is this going to end? When will this, you know, turn around? Can feel very, very daunting and I further isolating and further mentally heavy, leading one further down into paths of depression. Um, especially if you're struggling um, with that work-life balance, you know, I'm, I'm looking at those in particular who have kids at home that are also facing um, difficulties finding their balance and doing school from home, as well as your balance and trying to do work from home with your kids doing school from home. There's a lot to juggle and it can be daunting thinking about when is this going to stop. So that's the bad news. The good news is that we have the ability to move forward with all of this, and I'm here to show you a couple of tools that you can use and a couple of mental reframing um, abilities that you already have that you can tap into um, to help yourself manage the stress 
make this less daunting of an experience and get back to a mental health level of normalcy, at least somewhat. So the objectives that we're going to go over here in the next couple of slides are looking at taking care of your body, taking care of your thoughts, modifying your behaviors, identifying and engaging with your support system, and identifying and setting boundaries. Setting boundaries between your work and um, home life and even, you know, managing your childcare. And if you have um, a significant other, that relationship, having distinct boundaries between all of those while living in potentially close quarters throughout the whole day, um, seven days a week, is going to be something that you know can be very beneficial to start working on as soon as possible so with taking care of your body physical health matters your physical health impacts your mental health your mental health impacts your physical health um, quarantine has caused many people to move less um, but you can stay active at home making sure that you include ritualistic and when i say ritualistic i mean like daily activities that you can engage in such as going out on walks, um, being able to even just get up from your chair wherever you might be working from home and doing a little lap around your house or moving somewhere else, but making sure that you're getting up frequently and taking small breaks to get physical can be very helpful. Um, and when I say these things with movement and eating habits, I want to make an emphasis on only really try to attend to things that you actually can institute change over. For example, if you set yourself a large goal, like I'm gonna wake up at five o'clock in the morning, every morning and take a three mile run, it's going to feel like a daunting job of an activity and you're not actually going to participate in any level of uh, physical health awareness if it becomes so daunting and so overwhelming that it just feels like another part of your job. When you're choosing activities to actually install in your daily life, make sure it's something that is small and manageable that you actually would be willing to and able to participate in on a daily basis. So the objective here is small, manageable bounce of movement. Same thing with eating habits. You know, eating impacts your mood more than you think. Um, so if you're putting junk into your body, you're putting junk into your mind. So be mindful with your eating. And I know mindfulness is a buzzword. What I mean by mindful is be intentional physically and mentally with the food that you're, you're um, choosing and the habits that you're engaging in with food. Like I said towards the beginning of this, we're creatures of habit. And just like we can fall into substance abuse very quickly without really even realizing that we've formed a habit with it, the same thing can happen with food. So be mindful and intentional with your food habits during this time. Also, sleep restores the body. Um, one big tip, and there's a study that I'm trying to find my um, citation for. If I can't find it right now, I will email it all to you later. Um, but there was a popular study done uh, about five years ago on sleep that noted that if you are engaging in activities such as studying, working, reading, or playing video games, or watching movies or TVs, TV in your bed, you're going to be more likely to have trouble sleeping. And what the study actually found was that your brain associates the space that you're in with what you do there on a regular basis. Again, going back to those creatures of habit. So if your brain associates being in bed with being mentally active and mentally in a workspace, you're going to have a much more difficult time falling asleep because your body is already trying to prepare you to stay up to do the tasks that you're trying to do. Even if you don't have a book in front of you or your laptop in front of you, your brain has associated that space with this is what you do here. So pay attention to sleep hygiene. That, those are the things that we call thing, uh, uh, healthy tools for sleep. So one, do not bring work into your bed try to keep bedtime for restfulness. Um, the other thing is, you guys have probably heard this, blue lights on your screens and devices actually waken up your brain and tell your brain that it is time to be active, it's time to be thoughtful. So making a turnoff time for all devices is helpful. Some devices um, you can download apps on to actually reduce blue light. 
I would still say you might want to shut those off at a certain time, but those are technically viable options as well. Um, also maintaining a routine around your bedtime, trying to go to bed around the same time, have roughly the same setup to your nightly routine can help, again, your body get in the mode and be ready for sleep time. Taking care of your thoughts. So again, your physical health impacts your, your mental health and your mental health can impact your physical health. Um, one of the things that I like to talk about when I, we talk about taking care of your thoughts is looking at your self-talk. In other words, that kind of internal monologue that you have going on throughout your day about yourself. Um, you know, just take a couple of moments and notice how frequently you would say those are negative versus positive thoughts. And if you've noticed that you have an overwhelming amount of negative thoughts or critical thoughts as opposed to positive thoughts, that's an area where you can already start work. Um, many of us who struggle with negative thoughts, they might be automatic. They might not even be something that we're putting a lot of intention in. It's just an internal running dialogue and they already come up and start criticizing. Um, as a therapist, tools that I give my patients that I work with who have regular negative self-talk is to start becoming intentional when you can. In other words, you can't know what you don't know. So number one is get a baseline of how frequently those thoughts arrive. And roughly, if you can find any patterns of what occurs around those thoughts, are these thoughts related to, you know, more? do these thoughts come up more often when I'm at work? Do these thoughts come up more often when I'm feeling stressed? So on and so forth. Once you have noticed your pattern with thoughts, if they're negative primarily, during those instances that you found yourself particularly vulnerable to those negative thoughts, start intentionally trying to repurpose those thoughts, or in other words, take control of those thoughts during those times. So if you know that morning meeting is when all of my self-criticism comes out, already start intentionally going into morning meeting with the, the mantra or the thought that, okay, I'm going to think a few things positively about myself before I go into this meeting. It takes a lot of unlearning and relearning with negative thoughts. So we have to unlearn what it is that our negative thoughts are saying about us and telling us and that we're internalizing. We have to unlearn it and then go through the full process of relearning a whole new way of being with ourselves. And you can't do any of that without first getting a baseline. So I would encourage those who struggle with regular negative self-talk to start becoming aware of when that self-talk comes up, how often it comes up, and roughly when it comes up for you. The next step is to try to find positive things that you actually believe about yourself. Now here's the thing, we can't make ourselves believe anything that we don't. So I want you to actively look at things about yourself that you can recognize without much fuss, without much strain on self, that you can acknowledge is positive about you during those times. And I want those to become the things that you start to try to tell yourselves in those particularly difficult or stressful times. Again, it's an intentional practice. It does not come without, um, without effort. It doesn't come without intentionality. So it has to be an intentional process of reprogramming yourself when those moments come up. The other thing is sometimes gaining perspective can help. If you're, if you're a person who gets overwhelmed really easy, um, I know for myself, my, my particular high point of stress in the morning is when I log into my email for the first time and I see how many emails say Gabby on it. And in those moments, I can feel so small and crushed and absolutely absorbed by everything around me. The thing that can help with that is zooming out or looking out to the bigger picture and assessing what really are major barriers and problems versus minor inconveniences. Once I'm able to look through the emails and just kind of give a general scan of everything, I can see, okay, this is someone just checking in with me. This is someone just giving me an update on this and nothing that I actually have to attend to. So oftentimes we bog ourselves down before we've even started in certain tasks, especially if we're prone to being overwhelmed easily. Um, and if this is something that you recognize about yourself, making an intentional practice of just kind of sitting back 
acknowledging the emotions that come up, the, the anxiety that might be there, um, not pushing those emotions down, but just acknowledging them and not necessarily acting on anything. Um, give yourself a few moments to reset, ground, we'll go through grounding techniques here in just a moment, and let yourself just get a general idea of everything going on, zoom out, look out to the bigger perspective, before you start focusing on, I've got 12 tasks on my list and I don't know how I'm going to get them done today. Focus on the bigger picture and move through your list. Um, practice mindfulness. Again, when I say mindfulness, I mean being intentional with your thoughts, being intentional with your body. Um, deep breathing is something that you've heard probably often. When I say deep breathing, I mean taking deeper, longer exhales than you do inhales. That's what deep breathing is. It's not taking big, long breaths in and big, long breaths out. It's taking a normal breath in and a slow, intentional deep breath out. That is shown to be one of the most common breathing techniques that we have. Now, here's the thing. If you are prone to asthma or you have any other breathing uh, troubles, deep breathing might not necessarily be your thing. Use what works for you. But that is what I mean when I say deep breathing. So practice mindfulness, practice deep breathing, or other techniques that help create calmness and quietness in your mind when you're not working or during breaks. Now, I want to highlight that. Practice your coping techniques. Practice your de-stressing techniques, your calming techniques, when you're not stressed. Why do you do this? Because the more that we're able to program ourselves to do these things more regularly, how many people here have had um, uh, bad habits just kind of pop out out of the blue and you've had trouble getting them under, uh, you know, uh, under control after they've popped up? It's really easy to fall into bad habits. It's really easy to fall into good habits. So how you start forming good habits is you start engaging in mindfulness, deep breathing, and calming techniques when you're not stressed. It gives the brain a chance to actually acclimate to the understanding and the idea of doing this regularly and going through it however it is that is, is beneficial to you so that in times of stress when your brain is having trouble searching for positive coping techniques and positive ways of being, that it has an easy go-to. So start forming daily practices, again, daily practices that you are actually able to and willing to engage in that are not overwhelming. Start forming those regular regimens with positive coping techniques now. Start forming them during times that you're not stressed. Start forming them during break times, during off times, so that when the difficult times do arise, you have it there and available for you. And going back to positive self-talk, it helps build a sense of self-efficacy or belief in yourself that you can complete what you set out to accomplish. So all of these things kind of build into each other. You know, the, the positive self-talk that we formulate in our break times and our off times that we foster intentionally before we go into that negative self-talk start to already build a feeling of self-efficacy that we can continue in this direction. So as I was saying, I'm going to give you guys a couple of tools to use as grounding techniques and, and you know, self-soothing or self-calming exercises, and I'll kind of lead you through a handful of them in these next few slides. Now, one thing that I want to note about um, calming exercises or grounding exercises is that they work differently for each person. You might be somebody who benefits deeply from deep breathing, or you might be somebody that gets more anxious from deep breathing. If it works for you, great, hold on to that tool, make sure it's something that you have available for you to utilize. If it doesn't work for you, don't use it. Um, and you'll notice in these grounding exercises and these um, self-soothing or self-calming exercises that I'm going through, um, typically what makes a good um, coping technique or calming skill is using a combination of mind and body. Um, again, Mindfulness is just kind of the intentional focusing of both your mind and body. So these grounding exercises, you'll notice, is going to take into consideration our physical body, our physical space, as well as focus our mind on something. 
So for this grounding exercise, this is one that we often use for individuals who are experiencing high feelings of dread, overwhelming feelings, or feelings of anxiety. So whenever I start a grounding exercise, I like to get comfortable in my chair. I'll invite you all to take a few moments to get comfortable in wherever you're at, whether that's sitting, laying, lounging, get comfortable with where you're at. Once you've found comfort, start to just notice your breathing. You don't need to do anything intentional with your breathing right now, just notice it. As you tap into the natural feeling of your breathing, I want you to look at the space around you. And I want you to start to identify five things that you can see. Once you've identified those five things that you can see, I'd like you to feel around you and identify four things that you can feel. It might be your chair, your fingertips, but notice four things that you can feel. And now notice three things that you can hear. Two things that you can smell. And one thing that you can taste. And if you're so inclined, take a regular breath in and an intentional longer breath out. This grounding exercise is really helpful for getting yourself back into a slower intentional rhythm. If your anxiety is speeding your mind up to 100 miles an hour, if your brain is going into the next thing on your schedule and the next and the next and the next, this is something that can get you refocused and make you intentionally start to slow down. Again, it's not a cure-all and it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but if this is something that even remotely worked for you just in this moment, I would encourage you to use this as maybe something that is those that are those tools that you start to build and start to utilize and use even when you're not stressed. So that when that stressful email pops up on your laptop, you have something available to you. Um, moving along to another grounding exercise, this is again focusing on senses. Once again, being mindful is bringing your mind and your body together. And sensations and using our senses is one way that we can really, really help tap into both at the same time, both our body and our mind. So once again, I'm gonna ask you to st either stay in your comfortable position or adjust and find a new one, whatever you feel most comfortable doing. And I want you to begin by slowly closing your eyes and lowering your eyelids. If you would like to keep your eyes open, find one thing in the room that you can just focus on and keep your gaze there. Once again, start to just notice your breathing. You don't need to do anything with it. Just notice it. And I want you to slowly touch your face. your arm, maybe your hand. Focus on the body part's temperature. Is it warm or cold? Focus on the pressure of your touch. 
Is it light or firm? Now focus on the texture of your skin. Smooth, rough. Finally, focus on the presence or absence of moisture. Is it dry or is there some moisture? Just try to relax into your sensations that you are feeling. And again, I'll invite you to take a normal breath in and an intentional, deeper, slow breath out. Becoming in touch with our body, our physical being, can be very helpful if you're experiencing any sort of um, anxiety-based physical sensations. Some people might suffer from panic attacks, such as, you know, and, and those sensations can include a feeling of almost lightning, like sensations going through your limbs or your fingers, or maybe a feeling of numbness. Um, or for those who deal with regular tension, you might feel a lot of tension throughout your back, your shoulders, your neck, so on and so forth. Making it an intentional moment or two in your daily practice to focus on what you're feeling in your body, where it's coming from, and maybe intentionally relaxing yourself in those areas of your body where you feel tension or uncomfortable sensations can be helpful. I know many of us don't have necessarily the best posture in our chairs, something I work on in a regular basis, and trust me, at the end of my day, I feel it. Spending a couple intentional moments, even though it's not going to cure my posture, it's not going to cure my pain outside of being intentional with my body in those moments, Taking a few moments to actually focus on how that body part is feeling and trying to make some relaxation where I can. Is that body part tense? Is it, is it tight? Do I need, maybe need to get a heating pad and just relax on the couch for a little bit with my heating pad? These sensations and getting in touch with your body can be an important part of being able to manage your daily impact on your body and your mental health. And finally, we're moving into modifying your behaviors. Again, be intentional. Set one to three small goals each day. Write them down, cross them off your list at the end of the day. And again, remember, try to set yourself manageable small goals. These are goals that you actually will engage in with little to no effort. Um, oftentimes when I hear people share with me, you know, what coping skills you might have available to you, I hear all sorts of great things like I paint, I direct short movies, I knit, I sew, I do, you know, I hear all these great things throughout the day that people like to do that calm them down, help them feel accomplished and give them some sense of um, pride or happiness. All of these things are great. But in a pinch, when I'm looking in my morning emails or I'm in morning meetings, going out and bringing out my easel and my acrylics is not necessarily viable. So we're looking at small manageable things that bring sensations of calming, soothing, and coping without much effort. Um, you know, when it comes when it comes to the small manageability of it and and the coping skill as a whole. Coping skills and, and calming techniques and grounding techniques are not meant to bolster you to a place of being extremely happy. They're not a cure-all, they're not a fix, and they're not something that's going to instantly change your whole mindset and your whole mood. The purpose of a coping skill or a grounding technique is to help you stay afloat. If you are drowning in an ocean of anxiety and being overwhelmed and stressed, it is a flotation device. It is not the helicopter here to save you. So if you're implementing a coping skill and you're feeling like I'm not doing this right, it's not doing anything for me, if you're able to stay afloat, it is, and you are doing it right. Um, Self-care is an important thing to keep a regular check and balance on. Do something nice for yourself. Do something nice for yourself today. Try to make a, a goal, a small manageable goal of doing something nice for yourself each day. Um, give back, do something nice for someone else. A lot of people feel accomplished or feel a sense of um, grounding or centeredness and being able to give back. 
Gratitude lists are another way, great way of making a daily intentional goal of focusing on positive aspects of your life. Um, I always give homework assignments to, to individuals to have a sticky notepad next to your bed on your nightstand or, you know, within good reach of your bed um, and have people try as best as they can remember when they wake up to write down three things that you're grateful for, either about yourself, your environment, or someone else. By intentionally writing down your gratitude each morning and having an intentional focus at the start of your day on gratitude, you're already setting your mind up for positive headspace. Um, I know for myself, I have an example of uh, the opposite, you know, waking up and being in a really grumpy mood for the rest of the day. My cats, sometimes when they're hungry, they like to knock things over and break things. If I wake up to my cat knocking something over and breaking something, my mindset is instantly in this annoyed space and it's annoyed and I'm annoyed for the rest of my day. So if we can acknowledge how waking up in a grumpy mood and staying in a grumpy mood is something that many of us have experienced and can experience on a regular basis, the same is true for the opposite. And trying to set yourself up for success through engaging in small manageable things like this, even though they might seem minute, even though they might seem repetitive or unhelpful in the moment, can really have a lasting larger impact on our overall mental health, our, our perspective, and our mindset for the rest of the day. Um, I also recommend spending at least 30 minutes a day away from technology. You know, again, going back to our first slide, headlines are not helpful right now as far as the fear mongering that many of us have seen. Um, and they're everywhere. They're, they're all over social media. They're on um, home pages and home screens. So trying to take a step back away from potentially stressful technology and maybe even friends or family on Facebook who are continuously annoying with their posts. Taking a step back intentionally each day for 30 minutes can cleanse your mind. No one can make you react or feel any certain way, um, that's a fact. Being on social media, seeing these headlines, seeing your annoying family mem members, they don't make you do anything. They don't have the power over your ability to manage your mind. It might feel like it. It might feel like, great, Aunt Sue is posting about fill in the blank again. And you get that instant sense of annoyance. However, you have the intentional choice to continue to focus on building and fostering that emotion or taking a step back, zooming out, using a grounding exercise, getting off of that page for another day to set yourself up for success. So I want you to start identifying and engaging in your support system on a regular basis as well. Um, during this time, many individuals are facing high levels of isolation. Um, and I know that, you know, it's not necessarily a viable option to have gatherings like we used to before. Um, but finding ways to engage in your support system still with the tools that you have available to you can be key. Um, you know, we're doing this right now. We have these, we're, we're fortunate and lucky enough to have this great virtual platform that I'm able to reach out to all of you and you're all able to, you know, communicate to me with your questions and your thoughts. Um, and so knowing that you have tools available to you, whether that is texting, calling, or chatting, or whatever method you can, I know that for myself, I've definitely been using video chat more than I ever have um, in past years, just to be able to have some semblance of that connection. But it's important to continue to foster that as isolation is one of the leading causes to depression, um, substance use, eating disorders, and other mental health issues. Set boundaries with yourself. Um, so I know saying no can be very hard for many of us, but if you know that your workday ends at a specific time, try to keep your workday ending at that time. Um, try to, again, limit the amount of social media use, such as, you know, you might set a rule for yourself like, okay, I'm gonna stop technology after dinner. After dinner, that's when I put all the devices away. Set those boundaries on your sleep time. 
set those boundaries with yourself when you're feeling that you're stretched at the end of your ability. It's okay to say no and take a step back, whether that's with work, social media, friend groups, family members, no period is a complete sentence. Um, and further on boundaries, you know, acknowledging that many of us are working from home, I want to acknowledge that, you know, I don't know every person in this, in this presentation's home situation and some homes might feel tighter and more cramped than other homes as far as how many people are in it, how many people have computer usage going on, what rooms are available. Create boundaries where you can, and this means getting even creative as you possibly can. Where you're seeing me today, where I'm broadcasting from, is a place in my bedroom that I have designated as my work spot. I have cornered myself off and gotten myself some of my nice, comfy office tools and chairs and everything available to me. When I get in this spot, this is my work zone. I don't read in this spot. I don't play video games in this spot. I do work in this spot. And when I'm out of this spot, I don't do work. Keep your work boundaries at home. It's key. If you don't have that boundary, that previous study that I was talking about is going to come to fruition. Your mind is going to start associating every area of your home with work. Keep your workspace as separate as possible. If not in a different room, if not in a different area, make a space. And that space is your workspace. If you do work in that workspace, you don't do work elsewhere. Otherwise, your brain is going to start associating all I do is work. And if all you do is work, your mental health is going to become very, very depressed. It's going to become um, anxiety. Everything that you do is going to carry that anxiety that you might hold with work outside of it. So we started with the bad news. Now I want to give you the good news. 51% report that they have more time to spend with their family. We're at home all the time. There's more times within breaks that we can find to give each other a quick hug, have meals and lunch together, all of those produce bonding. 30% report that they have more time to get work done without interruptions in their office. 31% report that they are getting more sleep. Companies have found ways to circumvent the barriers of COVID-19 by creating and allowing many people to continue to work versus furlough. Other countries, such as the UK and New Zealand, are discussing four-day work weeks to improve domestic tourism, and now that working from home is becoming more productive for companies, it's more viable. Employees are saving more money and time on gas and commuting. So self-care isn't selfish. It's not selfish in the sense that it's something that you should feel ashamed of. Self-care is important for your ability to function in your other roles. And without you taking care of yourself and filling yourself up, you won't have energy to take care of anyone or anything else. So if you take nothing else from this, take the point that it's important to care for yourself for the mere fact that you cannot continue going on empty. And here's some information. Thank you very much, Gabby. Uh, that was very informative. I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. Now is the time to post those questions that you have into the Q&A section. And Gabby, we do have one question already, and that is, uh, what portion of the stress do you think is attributed to COVID and President Trump's governing? And do you feel like the the transition the new administration is going to help that stress that's a good question um i think it's an individual thing based off of your personal um environment especially you know your home life if you're surrounded by family members or peers that have a certain political leaning um it has an impact on your stress so i guess where i'm going with this is that i don't think it's necessarily tied to one politician versus another politician. Um, because again, nobody can make you feel in a certain way. What it does, where I do see most of the impact coming in at, where I do see most of the stress coming in at, is the environment. So what the environment is saying, regardless of if it's Trump, Biden, or who's he, what's it, leading our office. 
if the the social media pages that we're on, if the the media that we take in and the people that we surround ourselves are calling doomsday every hour, that's where the most of the impact is going to come from. So it's not who or what per se, but how we are taking in that information and perceiving it. Yeah, that's that's a great point. But it's it's what we choose to do with the messaging that we're receiving. So uh, don't um, don't let this opportunity to ask a question slip you by. If you have any, if you'll go ahead and post those, I'm happy to to get those. Gabby's happy to to answer those. Um, we will give it just a, a minute to see if anybody else has a question. You always, uh, and if Gabby, you want to put that contact screen back up. Um, yeah. While we're, I'll go over that while we're waiting, and then if we don't have any questions, we'll go ahead and um, give everybody back some time in their day. So, any questions that you have, uh, if you're watching this um, as a recording, or if you think of questions after uh, this presentation, feel free. Uh, Gabby's email address is up here, my email address and phone number, and I'm happy to uh, get that question to her or our other clinicians. Uh, to respond, you also have access uh, as an employer paid benefit um, by Altair to an employee assistance program, an EAP, that provides free and confidential assessments, short term counseling, referrals, and follow up services for you and your family members. And EAP is a, a very beneficial service that can uh, help you with uh, personal issues. Um, community resources, uh, it's something that I, I definitely, I always encourage people to consider it like a library. If there's something that uh, is an issue for you, uh, it's free, it's confidential, it's worth a shot of calling to find out if they can make that process easier for you, share information with you, or provide resources that can help you to navigate that issue a little easier. And then you also have access to Altair's uh, health services. And we have Diane Towers, the um, nurse who heads that program. We have her information here, including her on-call 24-7 number. Uh, so Diane is available to assist you with any concerns that you have. And I'm Oh, I do see some questions. Let me look over here and figure out how to get to them. How to deal with how to deal with guilt from needing time off but having too much work to do. That's a good one. Yep. That's a really good one. Um, whether it's guilt related to work or you know maybe even parent guilt of you know stepping away from not managing your child's homework as much or spending as much time going on outings with kids. Um, guilt is definitely right for there. So what I would say is helpful to managing that guilt is to go back to that intentional rephrasing and go back to that intentional looking at positive mindset. If we already go into taking time off or, you know, um, you know, fill in the blank, whatever is giving you guilt, we already go into the situation with the, the thoughts or the idea in our mind that we're not good or that we're not good enough, or that we're not doing enough, or that people won't like us for, for taking care of ourselves. If we already go in with that mindset, it's going to then take over our whole perspective of our time off. And then we're going to feel like we have no time off, right? If our entire vacation, um, say, spending two days at home as opposed to, you know, um, going to work or being virtual with work, your mind's already going to start ruining that vacation by focusing on the guilt. So I guess what I'm trying to say is intentionally before you start taking time off, if you know that that's something that you feel guilt from and a lot of negative self-talk from, intentionally go in with thoughts about what it's benefiting yourself and maybe others. You might go in by saying, taking this time for myself is going to help me be more productive when I get back so that I'm not drowning in work and so that my coworkers are not drowning in work. By me taking time off, I'm able to de-stress myself to a place that I can start making more positive and um, sound decisions when I do get back to work. So it's retraining your brain to think of what it's benefiting you, 
your work and others around you by doing this self-care. And another really good question that we have, says I'm having a hard time getting motivated to work out. I have the desire, but just can't get myself started. So any tips, Gabby? Yes. Yes. So again, small manageable goals. I often suffer from this too, where I'll set myself this big, great goal of every day I'm going to spend an hour on the treadmill. And at the end of the night, I'm going to do X amount of push ups and this, that, and the other. And oh my gosh, now that feels like another job. Now that feels like another thing that I'm not succeeding at if I don't get up at six o'clock in the morning and feel like I don't want to work out. Um, so set yourself with small manageable goals with your workout that gets you motivated to get into it. Because here's the thing about motivation. We don't feel motivated when we don't feel like it's an attainable thing. We don't feel motivated when we feel like it's another thing that we might not do well at or, or feel like it's a thing that is just another unachievable thing on our, our overwhelmingly large plate. Um, so set yourself up with small workout goals, such as take a 10 minute walk. My goal for today is to take a 10 minute walk around my block either before work, on my break, or after work. Anything else is great. If after that walk, I feel like, okay, I can now go and spend X amount of time on the treadmill. Fantastic. But start off by small things that aren't going to feel overwhelming. Because if we're overwhelmed, we're not going to feel motivated. Right. Great point. And here's one that I am hearing a lot in my work is tension between family members that have a different view of safety. Mm -hmm. And and I'm seeing this really around the holidays where you have some family members that want to have the friends giving and we you know we saw the family family gatherings the way that they always have. Everybody should come to grandma's house. And then others who are wanting to, you know, really isolate quarantine in their little bubble, suggestions for handling those tensions. Yes. So know yourself, know your needs. If you're somebody who feels like, you know, a, a big gathering or going over to grandma's house is going to be more exposure than what you feel comfortable taking on for yourself, know that. That's step one. Know your needs, know your boundaries, know your limits. Step two is the potentially difficult one, right? And that is actually setting your boundary. If you do not feel comfortable going over to grandma's house, I want to refer you to something that I said earlier. No period is a complete sentence. Many of us might feel rude or disrespectful setting boundaries with our family or our parents, depending on our particular, you know, backgrounds, cultures, or way that we interact with our family. Boundaries are not a hateful thing. Boundaries are not disrespectful. How you deliver those boundaries can definitely make a difference in how those boundaries are received. Um, but I would say, you know, in those situations, know yourself, know your needs, and advocate for yourself and your needs. If everyone's getting together in the family and, and you don't feel comfortable going to get to, you know, fill in the blank holiday or fill in the blank person's house for that holiday, um, you don't have to. And if the family members that you are with are still pressuring you, are still applying, you know, guilt or shame to you, guess what? We have great technologies that if they really want your presence there, you can still find ways of being there without physically being there. And if that's not enough, then it had nothing to do with your presence being there to begin with. It had to do with their ideal and idea of what they thought this holiday was going to be. So I say advocate for your boundaries when it comes to that tension. It's just going to be how you deliver it. Um, and, and so in saying that, maybe try to take a few minutes to get into one of those grounding techniques that we tried or anything else that works for you. Um, before you address it, don't set boundaries, don't set, um, don't have difficult conversations when you're already in a really anxious or aggravated mood. Set the boundary confidently, firmly, advocate for your needs, be willing to be flexible in what other options might exist. So we have, we have a lot of really great questions that we're going to not have time to answer today, but what we are going to do is to take all these questions, we will get them to Gabby and let her put together some information. That will be provided to Diane that she will be able to send out along with the recording of this. Mm -hmm. 
one of the questions is about a um, easy and simple relaxation exercise. So that's certainly something that we can even send you a, a very brief little recording of Gabby going through like she did today. And so um, very quickly, Gabby, the, the question that we will close on is um, that snacking more frequently than normal. And I think many people are probably finding that working from home, it's a little bit easier to go into the kitchen and have more variety to choose from than when we're at the office. Any tips? Um, tips would be to get back to, you know, what I stated earlier, trying to be more regimented. Um, so in other words, set yourself boundaries and rules that between the hours of 10 o'clock in the morning till 12 in the afternoon, I do not go in the kitchen. If I know going in the kitchen is automatically going to prompt my brain that it's snack time and that there's tasty things that I've just bought that I want to try and have, don't go in the kitchen when it's not time for your scheduled meals. So set yourself out a schedule. Set it out of uh, what time you eat breakfast at, lunch at, dinner at, and include a snack or two in between those, um, especially if you are somebody who gets hungry in between meals. Honor those hunger cues for sure, but make sure that you keep it on a schedule so that you aren't, you know, kind of rolling from one snack into the another snack until you've now had 12 snacks before dinner. Now you're not eating dinner because you're not even hungry for it. So schedule, schedule yourself mealtimes and snack times. And if going into the kitchen is, is something that automatically prompts you to eat, don't go in the kitchen until you've reached those times. If you're in a position where you work from the kitchen, you might start putting up stop signs. I know it sounds silly, but like stop signs in front of um, the cabinet or the fridge that make you sit there and pause before you open it, even if it's just on the ridiculousness or the silliness that I have a stop sign on my fridge. Um, whatever you can use to start slowing yourself down and becoming more intentional, that's what's going to set you up for success. Well, thank you very much, Gabby. And again, we will be uh, getting the rest of these, all of the questions and answers put together so that they can be sent out to you. So watch for that email that will come with a recording of this. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.